So it really got to looking into the question of whether or not there's really a definition of blackness in post-civil rights America, right? Um, and as we know, there's also ways you can perform blackness. So that got me thinking about it. Uh, then there was actually an article last weekend about a school in Virginia, a small town in Virginia, in which the school was formed, it was a private school. It was formed because of integration. So really they created this private school that was sort of a haven for, for white Americans. Right? So in 2008, this school decided that it really wanted to confront the issues that it had with race in this small town. So what they did is they went out and they recruited this kid who was a freshman in high school, 14 years old. Um, he was a quarterback, uh, played football. So they recruited him over to the school so that he could sort of be the ambassador for this school that has a history of, I mean, it was established um, to support uh, segregation. So now you have this young black gentleman who is serving as an ambassador for this institution. Okay? So I had that thought and you know, sort of thinking about this, and it really brought back to uh, things in my life and sort of how I arrived to the fact that I'm a nonprofit manager and writer. Uh, why, you know, which sort of things have led me to you want to do these sort of things, right? Um, so the first thing is that until I was probably about eight or nine years old uh, when I realized that, you know, being, you know, as an African American, I was actually a minority. Um, I actually went to this, this school in West Baltimore that was very Afrocentric, black focused. So I was surrounded by, you know, this uh, black children. But more importantly, though, every single piece of literature or image um, at this school that I went to, you know, kindergarten, uh, okay, kindergarten, was of some strong black dude. Okay, so I had these images in my mind of James Baldwin, Langston Hughes, all these great black leaders, and I just assumed at that age that everyone looked like that. Okay. So at that point, though, in, in West Baltimore, my mom realized that there was no really a great um, elementary school for kids. So my mom, we had a house at the time in Everson Village. My mom decided to actually move away from Everson Village. Uh, she got an apartment in Cross Country. So Cross Country is sort of a uh, predominantly white, um, a little bit more affluent community, especially relative to Everson Village. So I was able to go to this uh, elementary school where, at that point, I finally encountered and so that was really a change for me because I had not understood that whole concept. I just thought everyone was like me. Uh, and it was very empowering when I think about it later, right? Um, as I grow up, as I get older, my mother, she works for the, the circuit court system of Baltimore City. Um, and one of the things that she would always force me to do at a young age, talking about middle, uh, elementary, middle school, and through high school, she would tell me to come to her, visit her after school uh, because there would be a line of young African American males who were waiting to be seen by a judge. And so that's really a weird thing because I was like 11 years old and I didn't understand what that meant. Uh, my mom would tell me these horror stories about what she saw as sort of a, a tragedy, right, that was happening amongst African American males, obviously in Baltimore City. So she would have me come to school, uh, I would go to school, I would take a bus back um, downtown to get picked up a mother, but I would wait for about 30 minutes, and I would literally just sit in the lobby, and I would see this happen, this, this line of guys who are often sound just a few years older than me. So that had a heavy impact on me. Um, and oftentimes, that, it took a while for me to realize what kind of impact that would have on me. Um, so just to take it back, when I think about uh, the school that I went to in my pre-K and kindergarten time, um, the fact that it, it only till now did I realize that what kind of empowering thing that was for me. And so I could not imagine how you can live your life, understand being surrounded by very positive images about your community and how that can be very empowering, right? So the opposite is also true. Uh, and so when you don't see those images, you have the, the opposite effect. Okay, so then, you know, I get a little older, um, go away to college for a bit, in a small town called Lexington, Virginia. I went to a school called Washington Lake, and it was, in a way, I felt a little bit like the gentleman from uh, Virginia, the athlete, the football player, because essentially what happened was, I did really well in school, I got to pretty much all the colleges that I wanted to get into, but the deal was, 
but they offered, you know, pretty much they needed to get more diverse, right? So here I was, one of nine African American males in a school of about 1,200. So that's an odd thing to have to experience, particularly coming from Baltimore City, right? Um, so despite that, so I, I dealt with that. I was there for two years. I, I left, come, came back to Baltimore, completed my studies at UMBC, University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore County. Um, and so these, this, you know, beyond that, you have this story of sort of my interaction uh, with um, how it is to be young black in Baltimore, or just in general. Okay. Um, so now I live in Hamden. So if anyone's familiar with Hamden, you understand that it's sort of the. Uh, you live in Hamden. No, I like I just So it's it's, it's sort of um, a unique place because now it's really hip, and people want to live in Hamden and. And I like to go on the avenue and get wine at 13.5 and everything like that. <laughs> um, it's cool. But it's got a history of not being so tolerant for folks that look like me. Um, and so, in fact, when I decided to move to Hamden, my parents and grandparents just looked at me and said, well, what are you thinking? Like, why would you want to move there? And the sort of funny thing about Hamden, though, is that as a gentrifying area, it's bringing people that look like me, which I think is odd because <laughs> typically what happens is People that look like me get pushed out, mm -hmm. and others come in. But people like me are coming in, which is kind of strange, right? But that said, there's still a lot of tension in Hamden, right? I have uh, two white male roommates. Um, in one instance, I'm coming out of Rocket to Venus, which is a great bar in Hamden, right? Um, and it's these, these, these kids, and I say kids, but they're teenagers, adolescents. They notice us, and they throw out the M-bomb to me out of, you know, I'm polite company, I won't drop that. Um, but they, uh, they call me that, and of course my roommate gets highly offended and he wants to just go after these guys. And I'd have to pull him back, I'm like, I don't want to do this, right? Because what I realized at that moment is that I had lived most of my life sort of just dealing with that, right? Um, you know, there's a great quote, my favorite author, James Baldwin, says that to be rel relatively conscious in America and be black is to be in constant rage. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to paraphrase that a bit. Mm -hmm. But the unique thing about that is that, that while that's true, you get you learn how to deal with it. All right? Um, you sort of, it's, uh, it's a unique thing because at the one time you want to be angry, you want to express that anger, but you don't do it. And you don't do it in a certain way. What I've been able to do is through my writing, I think, I've been able to communicate that sort of frustration, um, I, at least personally from my level. And I've seen it happen with, again, all sorts of great black writers that I learned about initially when I was in uh, pre-K kindergarten and also reinforced in my house um, growing up. Um, so the thing uh, you know, sort of communicated is that what I've come to realize is that um, it's, on the one hand, you might see sort of this you know, you, see, you might see encounter someone like myself that very, you know, happy to speak with everyone and be um, um, very, uh, you know, uh, just have conversation and everything. But at the same time, there's a lot of stuff dealing with that, right? So, you know, we are, you know, sort of that negotiation of sort of being frustrated but also being um, accepting of everyone. You know, so a lot of people would say, well, you know, why wouldn't you be angry, right? Or why wouldn't you express that anger? And for me, it's sort of like it's, counter, it's counterproductive. So how do you find ways to um, ch change that frustration into something that's productive? And so that's why I sort of think it led me to be a nonprofit manager and to also do the kind of writing that I did. All right? So that's my story. Yeah. yeah.